Good everyone, I hope you're enjoying your meal. Welcome back. So we, I have the honor of um, kicking off our keynote speaker who will speak uh, over our, so we enjoy our lunch hour. So we are fortunate enough to have Ron Bevins, the Vice President, uh, Technology and Data Protection Officer from Benefit Hub. So Ron you know, is, has over 25 years of you know, experience in information technology, include, you know, including 11 years of hands-on information security management. Uh, he has a diverse background in security engineering, operations management, business continuity and disaster recovery planning, regulatory, regulatory compliance, and policy. Um, we've always found that Ron is incredibly well versed in risk analysis, vulnerability management, incident response, compliance, and information system ass assessments. He's a cybersecurity superman, basically. So, um, across the range of industries as well. So manufacturing, engineering, local government, corporate, and financial institutions. So as Ron takes us through bridging the gap between IT and the business, I'm gonna welcome up who I call the mayor of Tampa cybersecurity, Ron. So, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I also like to thank FutureCon for inviting me here. And I choose to believe that the audience is here to listen to me and not just eat. So just let me live my dreams. Um, also, everybody is virtual. Um, thank you. Hopefully, you're uh, enjoying food of your own. My talk today, we've heard a lot of technical, and we're going to hear a lot more technical. This is more on the people aspect of IT. When I use the word IT, it's an umbrella. Cybersecurity, security, infrastructure, anything that hits that technology range. If I say the word IT, that's what I'm referring to. IT was much shorter for the title than all of those. Um, I will talk about cybersecurity, I will talk about security. It's all interchangeable, interchangeable. So just realize that um, I'm using them as if they're all just IT. What is the gap that I'm speaking of? The gap is fundamentally what the business wants versus what we're delivering to them. From the 30 years of experience that I have in IT, I can tell you that I've seen this gap. We can fix it, but my goals today, and there's two of them, the first one is hopefully if you're hitting a plateau somewhere and you want to make that next step, hopefully this will help you sort out how to make that next step. And then my second goal is strive to change or at least challenge the way that you think about working with the business unit. Now I will point out that one of my goals is not making sure everybody in the room agrees with every single one of my points. We're in technology, I've been in technology too long to know that that's going to happen. But hopefully, the majority of people will accept the majority of my points. So who am I? He gave me a quick introduction. Um, I have over 30 years experience in IT and security and infrastructure. And the last 15 years, I've been in the management level. I've worked in manufacturing, engineering, local government, e-business, and, and financial institutions. I have CCISO, CCNA, I've got the alphabet soup. But what you can see is I have degrees, or I have certifications in technology, security, and management. I'm also the VP of technology and the data protection officer for Benefit Hub. I have chose today to talk about this. We were getting enough sales speeches. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about Benefit Hub. Come up to me, we'll have that long discussion, but um, I only have a limited time. So the problems that we're facing and we're going to try and work on is that the gap is real. Like I said, I have seen it in the last 30 years. I can tell you that it can be bridged, but it does take time and effort. It's not a quick fix. And I'm hoping that you can learn from my 30 years of mistakes, the bumps and bruises that I've had along the way. Whether I've done them specifically, or I have witnessed them, or repeatedly witnessed them. These are the mistakes that I have seen, and hopefully giving some idea of how to overcome each one of them. 
So the first mistake is bare minimum cybersecurity measures. What I mean bare minimum, it literally is checking boxes, doing the least amount of work possible to fulfill what you have to do. And I'll admit there are times when it's required. You have a deadline to meet, you, you can't put your heart and soul into it, you've got to do that bare minimum. But when it becomes the norm, that's when it becomes the mistake. As we've heard today, and we're going to hear again, any company is vulnerable. Any company can get ransomware. It doesn't matter if you're just a small company. It could be just a few thousand dollars. But as we heard in our first speaker, his son said, I'm going to be creating ransomware because I don't need to go to college anymore. It's the mindset here. It's a mindset globally. It's, it's making money. So don't just think because I'm a small guy, I only have 20 people in my company that I'm, I'm safe. No one's safe. If you're on the internet, you can be compromised. So we're going to look at how to do more than the bare minimum for security. Risk assessments. At least risk assessments for the security. What risks do you see in security? What is the ramifications if that the risk is exploited? And finally, any mitigating factors you have to help alleviate that risk for the business. Because at the end of the day, you're helping the business succeed, help bridge that gap. You should also pen test. And I'm lumping in, pen testers won't like me, but I'm lumping in local vulnerability scans as part of that pen test. You should have something in place to be able to do vulnerability scans both internally and externally, at least quarterly, and I would argue monthly or more, any major change, there should be a vulnerability scan just to make sure that nothing was left open by mistake. And that pen tester, at least once annually, you should be hiring a pen tester to review the security, both internally and externally, because when you find it and the people you pay find it, you'll be notified to fix it. If a hacker finds it, you'll be notified when things stop working. And finally, training. I will beat the training horse until it's dead. I, I believe with my whole heart we have to do the training. For this aspect, we have to do the training with security team. What are the risks? Do we share that risk assessment internally so that everybody knows what those risks are and what those mitigating circumstances are so that if we change one of those, we've got to come back and reevaluate the risk and see if we still are secure. We've got to be training the company. We've got to be training everybody else. But these are the steps to do more than just bare minimum. Because bare minimum is not what the business needs from security. Having more than bare minimum will help bridge that gap. Step number two, failing to get executive buy-in. If there is one thing you do with any project, executive buy-in should be it. So those that don't know, what's executive buy-in? The agreement from company executives or leadership to support or invest in a project. That project could be security as a whole. Or it could be installing a new policy, buying a new firewall, making changes to the environment. You need to get executive buy-in. Start from the top down. Convince the executives that it's needed, and everybody else can only argue with the executives and not just you. So, how do we get that buy-in? First off, we in security need to understand the company objectives. You have to know what the company wants in order to get executive buy-in, because if you don't relate it to what the company wants, it is far more difficult to get the company to invest time, resources, and especially money into that project. So once you understand that, then you connect security to the company strategy. You are trying to bake in security into every single business idea that's brought forth. 
the worst thing that can happen is executives don't think security and say, implement this. And you say, okay, well, I need to buy this, or I need to talk to this third-party vendor, or I need $100,000 to make that happen. And they look and say, sorry, we don't have that as part of the project, figure it out. And they're gonna expect you to. So you have that executive buy-in, so when the executives are talking, you've got that champion at the table, even though you're not, to at least say, hey, you know what? We need to make sure we have the security in place to do this. And it may not be we're gonna reach out to Ron to get that information, but at least it's been set as something that needs to be done before we can finalize that project. And finally, be specific. When you're getting executive buy-in, you have to tell that executive exactly what you want, exactly what it's going to do for the business, and what the outcome should be. And I'm saying specifically because you really, truly need them to understand it so that when they're asked questions about it at the executive level, they have some, probably not all, but some of those answers. Mistake number three, speaking tech, not English. When we're in the group here today, we can speak tech all day long because we understand tech. Speaking to the business tech is speaking Spanish to somebody that doesn't understand Spanish. It really is that different of a language to them. We start talking about three-letter acronyms that we all know, DNS, TLS. We just, we hear that, we translate it. They don't. They, you just see the, the glassiness in their eyes. I tried to make an example of this, and uh, it's, it's going to show my age. I, I, I appreciate that. But I believe that the music that's played today sets the mind. I believe that most of the people would get the reference, and if not, come see me afterwards and we have a movie to talk about. So tech, the tech way of saying what you want is... The flux capacitor needs 1.21 gigawatts in order to work. I say gigawatts as my tip of the hat to, to Dr. Emmett Brown, because he said it through every single movie. Um, it was before we understood it was gigawatts, so when I say gigawatts, I am saying it intentionally. But when you say that to the business, they don't understand what you're talking about. And I will say, personal experience, I made a joke. They said, Any, IT need anything? I said, well, the flux capacitor needs 1.21 gigawatts. Everybody just fogged over. And it was about 15 years ago. This is a 40-year-old reference. And nobody got it in the business. Because all the business truly cares about, lightning needs to strike the car for the time machine to work. That's it. That's what you need to share with the business. And they can come back to you and say, well, how does that work? I'm glad you asked. I can talk tech now because they're asking you for the tech. But they have to be the ones asking you. If you just go in talking tech, you're going to lose the audience. Mistake number four, I don't know. I'm not saying you need to know the answer to every question that's been asked to you. But I am saying, I don't know is never the right answer when a business asks you for something. It's okay to not know the answer, but instead of saying, I don't know, say, you know what, let me look into that and I'll get back to you. Because you really are still saying, I don't know. But what you're telling the business is, I'm gonna take ownership. I'm going to find this information. I'm gonna come back to you with that information. You don't have to track me down. They're probably going to want a time frame, and you have to rely on your previous experience. Is this question something I can Google and get back to you by end of day? You give them end of day. If it's something, I'm going to have to reach out to a third party, maybe multiple third parties, get quotes. That's going to take a bit of time, and it could be four days a week. You know your vendors more than I do. And usually if you say four days or a week, they're going to say, yeah, we can't do that. They can say we can't do that because now you've started 
to give them the understanding that you really don't have the answer. So now when you're coming back to them with an answer, you're saying, in my previous knowledge, fill in the blank, whatever they're asking you for, but you always end with, but I still need to verify that and I will get back to you to confirm. So you're not saying this is the answer. You're saying, I'm assuming it's gonna be something like this, but you're reminding them what you already told them. I don't have the answer. I have to look into it, I have to get back to you. And you have to realize what their expectations are in the time getting back to you and realistically give them expectations of what it's going to take for you to get back to them. Mistake number five is identical to mistake number four, saying can't be done. Never the right answer to give to the business. They don't want to hear it can't be done. You're throwing up a wall saying, I don't care, I'm not here to help you, leave me alone. And as harsh as it sounds, that's what they hear. That's their translation of it can't be done. Now, I'm also not saying they're going to ask you to build a time machine unless you're in the time machine building industry. It's, it's going to be something they need for the business. They're going to have the business reason in their head of why it needs to be done. You're there to tell them how it can be done. Anything is possible. How? With enough time with enough resources, and with enough money. I can do whatever you want me to do, as long as I have all three of those. So they come to you and they say, we need to go on-prem to the cloud in one week. I heard laughing, because we all know it's not possible. But I'm not saying it can't be done. Now you're saying, okay, in order to get that done, depending on your size, I'm gonna need 18 contractors to do eight-hour shifts in groups of six so that we can do 24 hours work, and I'm going to probably need to pay premiums for the, the company that I'm hiring to get these resources, and I'm probably going to have to go to multiple resources, which means I may have to pay costs for them to find those resource, resources for me. Oh yeah, and I'm probably gonna also have to increase the bandwidth to the highest we can get it to get all that throughput. So if you can give me a blank check, I can get this done for you in a week. Usually when you hear blank check, the business is like, nope, we can't do that. Great. They can say, I don't know. They can say that can't be done. They're the business. They're allowed to say it, but you didn't tell them that. You're letting them realize why it can't be done without you telling them. You're there to give them a solution. It's up to them to accept or decline that solution. Now, after you've told them what it would take, now you give them the options to get it done for their desired outcome. We have that communication now. What are you really looking for? Why are you moving completely to the cloud in one week? Was it because you just read an article that said the cloud is the only secure place and not your local data center? Do you know that for some whatever reason in one week from now, the building's gonna collapse and we're gonna lose everything? They probably don't have a realistic idea of what it's going to take because they ask you to do it in a week. But once you understand the reasoning behind them, then you can start putting together what it's going to take to get that project done within the budget that they're going to provide you, because it's going to cost some money. However much you want to sp spend is probably going to be how long it's going to take to get it done. What resources, resources you need, whether you have them already or you may need to pull in some external resources, all of that is now when you have that discussion. So you haven't told them it can't be done. You're telling them how it can be done. Mistake number six, no training. I told you, the training horse, I will beat it. I will, because 
Training is what we in security should be doing for the business. We all know what happens, what phishing where it, uh, what a phishing attack is. How does a phishing attack work? What to look for during a phishing attack? But we can't expect the business to know. It's not their industry. We have to train them on what they need to do if they see phishing. God forbid, if they click on that, what should they do? Hopefully it's not just close it, put your head in the sand and hope nobody notices and just let it run. Train them. If you do that, let us know so we can prevent it from getting any farther than it's got by the time we got there. And granted, it's not ideal. Hopefully we have other things in place to try and prevent it. But we all know we don't have every single tool out on the market. We've got to choose what we can have, what we can't have, and what the business will allow. So training is to help, ops help offset the biggest weakness security has. Humans. Human error is by far the biggest, biggest security problem that we have. I said it last year, I upset people, I'm gonna say it again. If you are not training your fellow employees, the rest of the business, you could be that biggest weakness because it's your human error that's making a security problem. You have to do the training. You just, you have to, it's gotta be part of life. When they're onboarded, there should be some training of what they should be doing with the environment, how they should be treating security, all the tools that they should be using. They need to be trained. Annually, they need to be retrained because things change. What we trained them on last year may not be what we train them on this year but it's up to us to recognize what needs to be done and train them on the new things for what's going on this minute of the day. Mistake number seven, trust everyone. Now I'm not saying that anybody who's been in security more than, I don't know, a year would ever open up a trust everyone. But what about something like Server rooms, okay, we have a badge, we badge read in, only those people that can have access in the system can get into that room. We've locked it down. What happens when you walk up and you walk past that server room and that door's propped wide open and hot air is coming out because the AC broke? Now what? Nobody's there to watch the door to make sure nobody's going in and out your fail safe that door is wide open. So now you're trusting everyone. You're trusting that employees aren't gonna go in there because they probably know they're not supposed to be in there and there could be bad ramifications that they do. You're trusting that any visitor that's there is not gonna go, ooh, shiny lights. Or you're trusting that somebody was able to piggyback by, I've got a box and my hands are full, can you let me in? doesn't see that room wide open and say, payday, I just hit what I needed. Same with networks. Do you have open ports that nobody's using that are plugged directly into the network for ease of use? Do you have some type of software or certificates on your laptops, your PCs that say, this has to be there in order for me to talk on that network? So somebody can't just walk in and plug in. Networks, you gotta talk about Wi-Fi. We probably all have strong encryption on our Wi-Fi because it's beaten into us from day one. What about guest Wi-Fi's? Do we have a password at all on guest Wi-Fi? Is that guest Wi-Fi on the same network? Because somebody, human error, opened the gap between the two. Or what about the new guy that just started that he was told this access point isn't working and he goes and he resets it and doesn't put a password on it because we don't put passwords. But he did it to one of the corporate networks and not to the guest 
Wi-Fi. Human error. You have to have those layers. The business is expecting you to put the right security in place. Remember that the hacker, the malicious person, is not only going to try and find the easiest way of getting in, they're also going to try and find the way that's least likely to be detected because that means they can be there longer than normal. That's not saying that if they find an easy way that they're going to go, oh, this isn't good enough. They're going to start using that, but they're going to keep looking. They're going to try and find some other way that, that's less likely to be detected, collect all that data before they try and pull it out or put ransomware in your environment. So we can't trust everyone. There has to be technology in place to help prevent that human error. Mistake number eight, stagnant policies. Anytime a policy is made, as soon as you click save, it's stagnant. Now, I'm not saying you need to change your policies every week, every month. At least annually, though, you should be looking at your policies. You should be reviewing your policies, updating those policies, making sure that if anything changed in the environment, you've changed that policy so the next person to read it is up to date on the environment. It could be annually that you make those updates, but major changes, make those changes. Update that policy, CYA. Make sure you have the exception process as part of that policy. Not every policy can be applied to every person in the company. Business need is going to need exceptions. And they need you to have that process. Who is the person or who is the group that's allowed to make that exception? You know, it's not somebody in marketing. It's probably the head of security, probably a C-level, maybe VP, maybe director, depending on what you have. But it's that one that knows by making that exception, what risk is that going to bring into my environment? Because you may need to go back and update your risk assessment. Document that exception in the policy. Whoever approved it, it needs to be in writing. Management approval. At that annual review, you've updated all the policies, you've made all the exceptions that are there, get management approval. Get executive buy-in. Because when they approve it, they are committing that the business is going to follow that policy. And that they're aware that that policy even exists. And probably one of the most important things to have in that policy, consequences. What is the consequence if I do not follow this policy? If the words up to and including termination is not listed on that policy, go back and rewrite your policy. Every single policy that's there has been approved by the business and is there to make the business better. Everyone that's supposed to be obeying those policies need to realize the potential of not following that policy could be termination. So I've listed eight mistakes. I'm no longer calling them mistakes. They're now ideas. We're going to take those eight ideas and show how we can bridge that gap between IT and the business. We can do it from the IT side. That executive buy-in is what helps it come back from the business side. But it's going to start with us. We have to help bridge that gap. So we're going to take no local administrator access. We are creating a brand new policy. Everybody has local administrator access now. We are taking away local administrator access. How did we get to this point? We did. We've already done bare minimum by giving everybody a local administrator access to do whatever you want so you don't have to come bug me. 
Now that you're making this huge change to the environment, you have to get executive buy-in. This has to come down from the top because all it takes is one executive to say, this doesn't apply to me, and you might as well throw out the policy. So you get executive buy-in. We said, how do you get executive buy-in? Speaking English, not tech. You're telling them exactly what needs to happen, exactly why it is so important for the business to take on this new policy. You're gonna also tell them some of the outcome. What's this gonna do for users? Because you know why you need to take away local administrator access. You know that having local administrator access makes it that much easier for bad things to get into your environment and for things to spread because whoever's logged in has local administrator. I don't need to ask, let me just do it and move on to the next machine. And not saying it can't be done without local admin, but why make it any easier? So as a business, we are going to do no local administrator access. You've already told the executive why to get their buy-in. We're not saying it can't be done. I am telling you, it can be done. I've done it the last three businesses that I've worked for, where I've walked in and they've had local administ administrator across the board, and now it's a policy there are no, no local administrator access. But as we said before, you have to do the training. You've already trained the executive on what they need to talk with every other executive to get their buy-in. You've trained your internal staff of how to remove it, why are we removing it, so that when they're questioned, they at least have some answers, not all, but some answers. And now you're training the employees that you're taking away local administrator access. What is the process now? So when they have Slack and it comes up and it pops up and says, put in your administrator access to update, it's not the end of the world. You can cancel and still use Slack. Your uh, patch management policy says you have 30 days to apply that patch. It was just released. We've got plenty of time. Put in the ticket. We will meet it within SLA long before that 30 days, so we maintain both policies, but you can still work with that older version of Slack that comes out like every three days until we get there and you close and reopen Slack and we put in the administrator password and it updates and then you have the newest version that has a new emote or whatever they added to it. But you're training them that this is not stopping you from doing your job. This is not impeding the business from succeeding. As I said with all policies, there are exceptions. When you have to make that exception and you have to give local administrator access, you need to trust that they're going to do the right thing with that administrator access. So, Say somebody decided all developers need local administrator access because they have an application that requires local administrator access and we don't have any tool in place that will allow just that application. So we have to give them. CIO has signed off on it, nothing you can do. It's, it's been recorded in that policy. So you've updated it, here's the exception. But part of that policy also has the consequences. So if that developer goes and decides that he's going on a week-long vacation with his family and installs the latest application so his kid can play on his laptop the whole time, there's a consequence for that. You break this policy, your local administrator access will be removed. You've just become a security risk and you've been shown that you cannot be trusted with that. But what does that mean? By that user's actions, his manager now, or her manager, has to decide. Can they still do their job without local admin access? Or, because they broke the policies, we might have to apply up to and including termination. You're there to show the business exactly what needs to be done to be as secure as possible. 
And you're hoping that by doing that, you can help bridge that gap with the business and you're more part of the team. Because that, at the end of the day, that's what that gap is, is not being part of the team. So I'd like to thank you, everyone, for sitting through my babblings for the last half an hour or so. Um, we do have time, so I'm going to open it up and actually say any questions. If you do have a question, please wait until the mic comes up. People online cannot hear it until the mic comes up. So I know we have a question over here. Right. Hello, hello. Hey, Ron, I wanted to say thank you for the um, talk. It was a great talk. Um, topics that we all know, but it's definitely a hard-fought battle. One of the problems that I've seen is that at companies, they to treat their employees like children or with an iron fence. How do you move it to somewhere in the middle where, you know, because I've had those discussions where it's like, what happens if you don't break this? And it's like, oh, well, we just give them a talking. And I'm like, okay, that's not stern enough or... How do we get it to the point where we let people know, like, hey, this is a warning. Next time it's a termination. Um, and usually companies don't want to have that discussion. Um, there usually has to be an HR function or something. But how do we get to the middle between treating like children and ruling with an iron fist? Thank you. Yep. Executive buy-in. You have to get the executive to accept that policy, including the exceptions, including the consequences. Something like this with the consequences, you're going to get HR involved because they need to accept that that is a consequence of not following the policy. So the only way this is going to work is from the top down. And I have been at places that have the exact same problem where it's just, oh, we're not going to do that. It's because you didn't get the executive buy-in at the beginning and the executive is saying, we're going to support this and we agree to these consequences. And that's probably a discussion that they're going to have talking internally, maybe who knows how many meetings, but they have to talk about it. They have to come to that exception because if they're not going to follow the consequences, it can't be part of the policy or you're going to fail the next audit. You have to have those consequences there. The executives have to accept them for the business and the executives have to be there to help you when they have to be enforced. There's another question up here. Hi, my, is, my name is Wolfgang Latino. Mine is more of a comment, and it's regarding to what the young man said mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, to get the executive buyout, what we did, we had created a steering committee that included uh, human resource vice president, the CISO, our risk management, and our legal department. We gave them examples of other companies that have had those issues, presented it, made it happen within a week. We, we hold quarterly steering committees uh, that reflect our fishing results mm -hmm. and what we're doing to those individuals. First, first is a strike, you get a training and a talk to. Second, you get a second training and a stern talk. Third one is termination. You can get buyout, you gotta have the right team to be in the buyout. Absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I'll also say that not every policy that is broken is immediate termination. I don't want you to think that that's what I am saying, but repeated offenses could involve termination, and that's why it's there. And you're not saying will be, you're saying up to and including. So thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Great talk, first of all. Um, I just had a quick comment. So I think one of the things that has helped me present an idea to business and get their buy-in is explain the impact to the business. Right. Once the impact is communicated appropriately, then they're more, uh, th they'll, they'll sign off on the consequences. Because when the impact directly relates to the business objectives or lack of being able to meet the objectives, especially when it comes to materiality and how much it means in terms of dollars, mm -hmm. then there's a, I guess everyone's much more ready to accept the consequences and sign off on them. Absolutely. And that's part of that buy-in process at the beginning is you, you get them through the entire process, what it's going to take, what it's going to take to enforce. Um, but absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Is there any other questions?
Anybody on this side of the room? I can turn my head this way a bit. No? All right, then um, no more questions. Once again, thank you, everyone. I appreciate the time.